As a practice owner, you need to know you need to know the numbers that tell you if your practice is healthy or not. Now, you don't need to know them like your accountant does, but there are some must-have numbers you just need to know. My guest today consults with practice owners to help them know those numbers, and she's going to share her insights with us today on Practice Care. I'm Carl White, principal at Mark Advisory Group, which is a healthcare marketing agency, and I'm also the host of Practice Care. The mission for both is the same, and that's to help private practice owners stay private. Care is better when the provider owns the practice and has the most freedom they're going to have to make the clinical decisions that they think are best for the patient. Unlike when somebody else owns them, wherever that might be, sometimes, usually, the their agenda can creep into the provider's ear in some way that might force some kind of compromise, however even small, in patient care. Let's just see if we can keep them all private and make life easier for the provider and the patient. My guest today is Allison Hulshoff. Allison founded an ABA company and a special ed day school in 2006, and in less than a decade, her company grew to 14 locations across multiple states with over 100 employees. In 2018, she sold her company and began working with investors to integrate multiple ABA businesses across the U.S. And along the way, she noticed that the owners she worked with had similar experiences that kept them from maximizing their company's growth and value. She founded OBOK Consulting, that's O-B-O-K Consulting, to provide guidance on financial and strategic planning for companies who are planning to scale or in preparation to sell, market exploration and growth, recruiting and human resource expertise, and compliance and revenue cycle management. Allison, thanks for coming on Practice Care. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And I want to start with where I start with just about every guest, which is just to get to know you a bit better. Your bio is necessarily short that I just read. Um, so fill it in. And I'm curious, why not just keep doing what you were doing? Why why do OBAC at all? You sounded like you have a, a really good thing going. And also, how did OBAC get its name? Yeah. Well, uh, to start, I owned 16 clinics and schools serving kids with autism uh, first. And when I had decided to sell, the market of private and equity investors was pretty hot. They were you know, paying really solid multiples on the even of, of the businesses. And at that point, I had felt pretty alone as a business owner. I was like, man, mm-hmm. there are a lot of issues that I wanted some assistance with. And I wanted it from somebody who wasn't an employee necessarily. I wanted some guidance from somebody who could see around the corner. Mm-hmm. And at that point, there wasn't a consulting firm out there that I was aware of that had really, you know, grown from grassroots into a large practice that had been sold and then had been through the whole process. I just, I didn't know who to turn to. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really know much about selling my companies. So I explored that, found a broker, sold my company. And I was really fortunate. I worked alongside a private equity group that spent, you know, a good couple of years educating me and allowing me to understand what made a business sellable. Mm -hmm. And once you bought that business, how did you systemize it, scale it and grow it with also having the ability to, to keep some of that integrity intact of what you bought originally. Um, COVID hit in the middle of that, which also made it really difficult to find small practices that were what I would call healthy enough to acquire. And so I really did struggle because I loved the art of being able to go out, identify those partners, find those strong clinicians and you walk through the business to be able to identify, were they healthy financially, clinically, were they, you know, I'm going to call it socially or culturally, were they a healthy business and would they be a good partnership? I loved that part of the job. uh, And I felt like that is what I was really good at. What I missed was the opportunity of once we acquired them, it was staying involved and engaged with them to ensure that what we had promised in the acquisition phase was really being delivered on. Mm. And so a lot of times things changed and other people were put in place to, you know, navigate and grow and scale. And I no longer had control of that, but I felt like I owed some sort of commitment to those owners who had sold to join forces with me in the first place. Right. Uh, so COVID hit, I have six children at home and decided it was time oh for God. me to change (laughs) partly because throughout my opportunity with them, I had saw over 300 companies in one year from all over the U S I had, I was getting on a plane on a Sunday and flying home on Friday. And there was a common theme among all of them. They were all missing certain things and they were all looking for certain answers. And I thought to myself, wait, this is pretty simple, right? If we just fixed these things, one, these people could maximize their exit. If that's what they were going to do, if they were going to retire or say, but I also realized 
they wouldn't have had to sell if they just, just had the answers to what they were looking for. So I decided at that point, I really wanted to focus on those small business owners and I wanted them to be able to feel good about the company that they owned, mm -hmm. but also feel good about understanding and knowing their numbers and running a business that was solid enough that made them feel like it was worth the risk of what they were investing into it. Because people are, you know, as business owners, we're away from our kids. We are working long hours. And mm -hmm. so there has to be some sort of financial gain. And there also has to be some sort of emotional uh, impact that comes back that says, yeah, I really love what I do. Otherwise, yeah you know, what are we working for? And so I wanted to solve some of those problems. Um, the name comes from Polish. It, it, the Obok means next to in Polish. My great grandma was Polish. She was a fiery redhead that, you know, came across to the U S and didn't speak any English and started from, you know, absolutely nothing lived here, married a, a lovely man. They had a child and, um, it was really lovely because I, I was so inspired by watching her work until she was in her late eighties, you know, working on her farm. I always just remember thinking to myself, man, she came over here, didn't speak English, you know, escaped during the war. And I loved just who she was as a human. When I went to start my practice, I thought, what is really important to me? And what do I want to give back to business owners? And it was truly to walk next to them. Mm -hmm. And if you've, ever tried to find and brand a consulting company, all the good words are taken. Yes. So. Well, yeah, that's true. So went through that about when I started. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah. <laughs> or or good names don't make any sense. They'd be terrible they don't ideas. Make any sense, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. And so today, Oboke, I mispronounced it. Sorry, Oboke, you work with a variety of types of businesses. Is, is it tell us a bit about who you work with? Yeah. We primarily work with healthcare service industries. So you know, we have clients who are establishing a new birthing center and they are midwives and um, mm. nurse practitioners. They are really focusing on wholeness uh, or wellness, functional wellness. And in, in our state, we had the opportunity where large health care facilities and hospitals really saw a difference in care after COVID. And we saw a lot of practitioners saying, I want to run my own practice. I want to focus on client care or patient care. And I want to be able to do it in a different way. And yeah. so we, you know, we have clients that do that. We have a lot of clients who are in the autism and applied behavior analysis space that are serving kids. We do speech therapy, occupational therapy, um, physical therapy practices. Really, uh, we've seen a large uptick in counselors. Uh, mm. So licensed health practitioners that are opening counseling practices and therapy practices. And um we are also seeing a pretty big boom of home health care. I think if you are following the home health care trend or home care trend, mm -hmm. it's space where as nursing homes are changing and the landscape is changing for long-term care, home care and home health care is becoming a really big need, right? Our population is aging and that care has, has to change. And so we those are primarily our typical clients. Yeah, and uh, 65,000 people a day turn 65 or some shockingly yeah. like where I live, you can't drive five miles without seeing a new community under construction. It's true, as well as the other ones, the demand for all of them is large and growing. Um, so you said it in, in your answer and you also said it in your bio, you said practice owners had quote, similar experiences that kept them from maximizing growth and value. What were those experiences? I Ironically, most practice owners we see will hire on another clinician or they will hire on practitioners or therapists and they they will look at that base salary only. And oftentimes we would get down to the numbers and I would say, this is great. You have five clinicians or five practitioners or five therapists, but you're losing money every single month. Like you're paying to go to work. Do you actually know what the caseload is what I refer to it as? Do you know what the caseload volume needs to be to support that position? And if you think about the different lines of industries we just talked about, you know, some work with a nurse's aide, some work with, you know, registered behavior technicians, some are working. And, and I, I was saying, so great, we've got this number for this practitioner, but did we take into account all the other things that go under it to actually ensure that the volume of clients that patients that we're seeing is actually supporting that position mm -hmm. plus a profit margin, right? Yeah. You know, did we think about the overhead, the taxes, uh, and is it realistic? Did you offer a salary to somebody that no matter how many people they see, 
you know, they'd have to work 80 hours a week to make yeah. you a profit. Yeah. And what's your profit margin that makes sense to you? Uh, we oftentimes see practices not understand that insurance and billing component of it. So I will say things like, do you understand your fee schedule? Do you understand what those contracts are requiring you to do? Did we accept fees and contracts that will actually be built on your business model? Mm -hmm. So if I build a business model where I'm going to call it a blended rate is, you know, hundred dollars an hour, but all of your contracts only puts you at, you know, put you at $65 an hour, you will never hit you got your a budget. Problem. Yeah. Right. And so we talk a lot about, you have to build your business globally in the beginning. Now, when you start a business from scratch, you don't know what those fee schedules are going to be, but we have to have a pretty good general idea mm -hmm. of what those are going to be, the market you're going to serve, how many people you have to serve to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, we also saw a lot of people who lived in the moment of, I'm going to serve, so I think I'm going to make X amount of dollars tomorrow, but... I may not actually have clients that show up every day or patients that show up every day. So maybe my attendance is really low. Uh, I might not be collecting co-pays, patient responsibilities, things like that. And so it would look like you made a lot of money because you served, but you made maybe didn't have great collections. And so mm -hmm. time, energy, and the money that you're spending to collect that money mm -hmm. was really disjointed. And so a lot of times those were the biggest things. And so I always say to people, what's your business model? Tell me about it, right? Let's start with that. Did they so, grasp that question? What's your business model? No, not in the beginning, yeah. right? So a lot of times the next thing I'll say is show me your budget. And often I would almost say 99% of the time people will say to me, well, I have a budget, but I've never used it. It doesn't make sense. And I'm already so far off my budget what do I do? And I say, well, then that's not a budget and it's not functional. A budget, yeah. right? Yeah. And you should be looking at it and it should be driving your decisions. And so I say, if it's too complex, it's not a useful budget, right? Yeah. So if you had to like, you know, the similar experience, it was this sort of, I guess, general lack of business acumen, business awareness. Is that how you would say it? Yeah. And honestly, I feel like there are so many business owners will say to me, I should know this. I know I should know this. And I say, maybe, but I'm not a doctor, so I can't do your job. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I always say to them, the only reason I know this is because after I sold my company, somebody else taught me how to do this. Mm -hmm. This was not something I was great at either when I was a business owner. Yeah. Because to be honest, I didn't realize how much it drove my day to day. Right. Yeah. So I start with, Let's figure out what actually makes a difference in your company because the rest of this is all going to be noise until we get control because business owners grow by accident all the time. Yeah. And I always tell people, that's amazing, but that is not going to be long-term and sustainable. Yeah. It's, you know, since I started this podcast and I've always known one of the reasons I started is because, you know, there's no training in school on anything business, but you hear story after story and it just, it gets a little angering that, mm -hmm. you know, it just feels somewhat irresponsible that they, you know, you would go to school to get trained and some proportion of every graduating class is going to go open up a practice, yeah. you know, you don't know who or when, but wouldn't you want to, I don't know, do consumer, I don't know. It's just, it's just, it's frustrating. It's just, it's just kind of frustrating. But we've even seen, even with people with business degrees who come out with business admin degrees yeah. with us, and I'll be like, great, let's check out your QuickBooks. And they're like, what? Yeah. And it's simple things like, what category are we spending that in? Did we plan to spend that money? Yeah. Did we actually gain anything by spending that money? Like, yeah. did you see? And what I always tell people is, what's your timeline, right? Everybody wants to make money and lose money at a different pace. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm a 90 day kind of girl, right? So I want to know that what I'm doing is effective within the first 90 days. And if I don't see a change, I don't continue to do something that's going to cost me money, mm -hmm. or me money or not make me money. Right. I will change what my business model needs to be if yeah. it's not effective in 90 days. Right. And that's one of the pieces that we coach people on is how long do you really want to lose money? Because usually they're coming to us. because What they're kind of answers do you get? Ah, I'll take 30 days uh, of losses. I, it's, I'm too busy to save money today. I'll save money tomorrow. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it depends on, I always, you, you said it well earlier, right? Like I, I always have to explain it to them. This might be what you want 
but I want to lay this out for you visually so you can see that this decision is going to impact you. Mm -hmm. Whether that means, because remember in, in the healthcare field, we might bill today, but not get our collections for 30, 45, 90 days. Mm -hmm. And so people will hold on to that 90 day pot of money that's coming in. And what I will say to them is let's just map this out over the next five months, because I want you to think about in December, you're closed three more days. Mm -hmm. One, maybe because of weather and holidays and in the month of November, you're closed. So if you're making X amount of dollars every day, but just by the natural event of the calendar, you're going to be way down. You're not going to feel it in December. Mm -hmm. You know where you're going to feel it? In January and February. Why? Because as practice owners, we have co-pays and deductibles that start coming in January. So if you ever want to feel cash poor as a business owner, you know, have a rough fourth quarter and the start of the year where insurance plans change, deductibles start yeah. over. So I say to them, do we have a bulk of money somewhere else that we can plan for this? Are we cash flow planning appropriately? Yeah. And they'll say, you know, what does that look like? And I say, super simple, right? Mm -hmm. Most of your expenses are pretty steady. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they'll say, well, yeah, but I didn't have as many people working in November or December. And I'll say, but you had PTO, right? So your expenses are actually going to probably be more than what you yeah. anticipate. Or yeah. maybe that's what you want to give pay raises. Yeah. Or it, right. Like people are out sick. And so it's walking through that process with them because they might have a whole bunch of money out in accounts receivable, right. Mm -hmm. Or a bunch of money might be coming in. But the question I always ask is what do you actually have in your bank account? Cause that's yeah. going to make a difference when payroll yeah. runs. It's so funny when you say just the number of calendar days, when I, if I flash back to when I was working in corporate and if ever there was a quarter or a year where sales didn't kind of quite come into where they were expected. The first thing we did was, were there as many days compared to last year? And if there was like one fewer day, we're like, well, you know, look, there was a few, one less yes. day. We couldn't, you know, you can't hold that again. So yeah, it's really fun. All right. So let's get into the numbers. We're here to talk about the numbers. So, you know, we as owners don't need to know the numbers to the depth and detail that our accountant, we expect our accountant to. But for you, practice owner, consultant, not an accountant, what are the few most important numbers that every practice owner should know, no matter what their specialty is and why those? So I think the very first thing is your expenses because you can actually control. And I always tell business owners, what do you need? Not what do you want? Mm -hmm. is what do you need first to make your practice sustainable, right? And my, my goal is that I can get them to put three months of working capital of all of their expenses into an account so that they are prepared for 90 days, no matter what. And working capital just means cash, right? Just money, just cash in the bank, cash. right? Yep. Cash, cash in the bank, savings account. Yep. That's exactly right. There it is. Uh, including what you're going to pay taxes on. Cause oftentimes that's a forgotten thing. Yeah. What I say to them is, can we just have a cushion? So when you're starting up and you're thinking about your startup <clears throat> money, how much money is it going to take to operate? Well, obviously that depends on who you're hiring and when you're hiring. And when we do the initial business plan, we're projecting, we're just, we're guessing. It's true. Yeah. That's why when you initially start a business, you want to go back in, you know, every couple of weeks and change those to what really actually happened mm -hmm. and make sure that we didn't overshoot so far, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's, you don't know the interest payment on your loan that you took out, maybe you ended up in a building and the, tr the triple net or the expenses of that building was higher. All of those things matter. And so very frequent business owners will not think about paying themselves anything. They're like, oh, I'll just take a draw. I'm like, cool. That's still cash out of your bank account. Yes. So the IRS I, might have a problem, but anyway, keep going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you still have to pay yourself some, I always say yes. to them, did you figure out what it takes to help you live? Like, did you figure in all your personal expenses and how you're going to pay yourself? Because you can't have another job when you're running your business, right? You yeah. have to run your business. And it has to sustain your, your own personal lifestyle as well. Yeah. And I think oftentimes that's forgotten. People are like, I'm looking at the revenue, but I have this great business, but I'm poor over here yeah. on the other side. But that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. Well, if I always say, if you feel like you're paying to go to work, something is not running well in your business. Yeah. And I'm not saying that you don't take risk and you don't invest to it because I think you can do that, but there has to be a plan. Yeah. And the second part of looking at those numbers, right? So now we've got the money it takes to start. And even if we are five years into a business, I set them down and say, let's walk through every single expense. Is mm -hmm. there anything in here that you are even 
oftentimes there'll be numbers in there that they're not even aware of. Mm -hmm. I'll be like, did you know you were paying Indeed every other week and you're paying them $400? No. And a fun test I will do is I'll say, why don't you tell me some of your expenses? And I'll just write them down. <laughs> and then we'll pull them up and I'll be like, whoa, holy bananas, right? There's yeah. a whole expenses in here that you're not aware of. They were subscriptions we signed up for online or there's been an increase. Uh, those are the types of things that we first go yeah. through. Let's yeah. just look at expenses first. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's helping them navigate through, you know, maybe I signed up with a recruiter and they're charging me $5,000 a month, but I haven't actually had a, you know, an employee from them yeah. in however long. And so we walk through and say, let's try to get you out of that contract. Mm -hmm. right? Let's see what we can do to decrease that. Yeah. The second number that we always look at is the amount of money coming in, mm -hmm. not just what we're serving, right? But what's actually being billed out and collected mm -hmm. and how much cash comes in. So I, I tell people like the back of your hand, you should be able to tell me an estimated amount of money that gets deposited into your checking account every single week. And people will no say, way they get that. There's no way they get that, right? You know what's crazy? If I use terms like, tell me what your AR is and what the collection timeline is, that will throw them for a loop. But if I just say, do you know each day of the week, Monday through Friday, every week, how much money comes in? They're like, kind of. I'm like, cool, let's map that out. Mm -hmm. Because on the 21st of the month, I might get a huge collection from one of my funders, right? And what I say to people is you should know that so well that if on week two, you didn't receive that payment, you have an immediate follow-up mm -hmm. and you follow up every day till you figure out where your money is. Because we've already built out a business model that says, we think you're going to collect X, Y, Z at the end of the month. Yep. If I wait till the end of the month to figure that out, I'm going to be in trouble because yeah. I'll have a cash flow issue. Yeah. So those are the two biggest numbers that we focus on. Mm -hmm. You know, I also always warn people at the end of the year, we're looking at something that's different, right? We're now looking at your QuickBooks and your profit and loss and your balance sheet. All of those things are real. They are relevant. We need to know those. They help you get loans. They help you, you know, kind of look at that big picture, but it's not in real time. And if that process of how you use QuickBooks or whatever accounting software you're using is so far removed from you and you don't get it. Yeah. Yeah to be an issue, right? I just had a business owner say to me, I didn't realize we were in the negative, you know, three out of six months. And I said, but you meet with your, your bookkeeper every month. How did you not know that? Well, I didn't know what it meant because she's saying, you know, don't worry, you're going to collect that money. Or there were three payrolls. And I'm like, yep, all that's real. But I also need you to remember there's a bank account sitting over here yeah. and we expenses and we don't want to be late to the game. And so my biggest piece of advice to business owners are, I want you to visually map out exactly how much you're going to serve, how much you're going to collect and how much mm -hmm. you're going to spend every single month in. And I want you to do it before the month starts, because that's the only possible way that you'll actually be able to control it. If you yeah. wait till the first of the next month, you've already lost money. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as you were saying, well, did, you know, your bookkeeper said yes, but don't worry. You know, I think another, I didn't think about this, but separate the fact from the assessment of the fact. Mm -hmm. The fact is we're in the red. Oh, okay. Is that a big deal? Well, the money's coming in. Okay. So if we're still in the red two weeks into the next month, I'm making this up. You got to call me because holy cow, that's yes. the fact. Separate the fact from the assessment of the fact. The assessment might say, yeah, it's fine. We, I talked to them yesterday, the checks in the mail. Okay, fine. But on the last day of the month, we're in the red. So I don't want late checks. What do we do about it? So Yeah. Yeah, separate the fact from its assessment. Um, so what is the best and easiest way to, so now you're, you're getting a sense, let's just kind of play out the scenario. You're getting a sense of your expenses. You're getting a sense of the money coming in versus the expenses. Um, what's the best and easiest way to monitor them? Because you can get buried alive in numbers that make no sense. You can become reliant on accountants and bookkeepers. And that seems like not wise, not because they're bad people, because this is your business, not theirs. And- you know, if you have a finger on the pulse of your household budget and household financial health, you ought to kind of have it similar. So how do you, but, but there's good ways to do this and yeah. bad ways to do this. So what do you, what do you recommend? So Especially for I, the non-business oriented, like I do no, no offense audience, like lots of you, us are, so <laughs> help us it's out. Too overwhelming, right? Our business owners are like, nope, I have other things that I can do that I'm good at. And I think humans in general want to do what they are good at. 
right? We don't want pain. We don't want s- struggle. We, we want efficiency and like easy. Not good at something. So and there's that too. Yeah, there's pride. Good at it, right? Yeah. So it's it's also really hard to openly say, man, I don't understand this. You know, I or I only understand a fraction of it. Mm-hmm. I think there's this. You have to remember, right? When you're the business owner, you have everybody else is you're paying their mortgage, right? They are relying on you. And so to openly say, I'm not really sure how to make this work is it's a pretty, um, it's pretty vulnerable space for a business owner. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, you know, it's true. You, you, you went to school to train, to, 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 to treat people. And that's true, but, um, you can't do that if you're out of business. You won't be able to, you know, this isn't, this may sound like money grubbing and just like a cold and clinical and sterile, this topic that we're talking about. But if you don't get these things down, the passion that you have, you won't be able to do it because your doors will be closed. I also think business owners need to know that there is a time to scale, right? There is a Mm -hmm. time to scale and grow and you can grow yourself right out of business if you're not careful. And so I say to them, you know, what would you rather have a solid lovely business that runs well and you pay yourself well and you pay your clinicians well and you you are I want to call it limitedly stressed but the quality of care that you deliver but it's financially sound if that was all great would mm-hmm. you rather have that or would you rather constantly be running and chasing and listen there are business owners that love the thrill of the chase right yeah i i think i love what i do because I love solving the problem. Like that energizes me. You asked I'm like why you. Yeah. I yeah. love solving the puzzle. Yeah. And that motivates me. Yeah. Um, probably more than the money, right? Yeah. Like I love helping, growing, and seeing successful business owners. So I'm like, yeah, let's do this. Yeah. Um, but I, you don't do it to the point where you bankrupt yourself, right? Right. And you could make the same analogy. I just love doing this and I'm sure the money will come in on time. Yeah. Enough of it. Well, no. Yeah. Now, that being said, I have made that mistake, right? Where I have given it away for free. And I'm like, oh man. Yeah. I think um, so back to your question. Um how to monitor. You know, yeah. Easy little, ways to keep track of the numbers you're supposed to be keeping track of. We use a tool, it's a simple dashboard. We call it the core report. And to us, it's a clinical operational report, right? Yeah. Now, it's that's a fancy name because we needed to name it something. And what right. we we identified as every business has the exact same type of metrics. And so we have a monthly core report, and then we have a weekly core report. And and each company, we just customize it for them, but it's very, very simple. On one side, I have the blended rate, which I assess the blended rate every single month because my insurance payers, I might have a different mix of clients. Mm -hmm. So if my blended rate is $100 an hour this month, that does not guarantee me it's going to be $100 next month. So at the end of every month, I reassess and make sure that my blended rate is still on point with what Mm -hmm. my business model was. And I do that very simply by taking all the money that we made with all the funders and we piece it out. It's just an average, right? Um, The second thing that we do is we piece out every clinician. And then if there are what I would call support staff underneath them. So whether it's nursing, whether it's technicians, whatever it is. And what we know is those technicians typically cost us less per hour. And I look at the ratio of how, if I pay everybody 40 hours or how many of hours they work, I actually look at what did I pay them? And of the time that I paid them, how many of those hours were patient facing? Mm -hmm. And during that patient facing, Did they actually create revenue tied to them specifically? Okay. Right? What's an example of patient facing, but not creating revenue? Like a follow-up call or a administrative work? This morning and I was patient facing and not creating revenue for them. I was helping with things like um, implementing their new toileting policy because it's in a little itty bitty early intervention clinic. Okay. I was patient facing and I was present because a parent came in, right? And if I was one of their clinicians, a parent came in and, and I was supporting the cl- the clinician who was leading the meeting, but I myself do not create any revenue, Got it. Right? Okay. but I was needed to help do some support task. Um, oftentimes we see that maybe I am in the room with the patient, but I am doing a cleaning task or maybe I ch- so in the, in the health and wellness field or in the nurse practitioner field, we will have a nurse. What that nurse does for those 30 minutes during that appointment don't, doesn't actually create additional revenue. 
what created revenue is what the nurse practitioner did, or maybe the doctor was doing. So essentially that nurse is client facing, but she's not generating revenue tied to her position. It It does. No, I totally get it now. Yeah. And I derailed. So let's go, but yeah, I, I, the next thing that we look at is the practitioners or clinicians or therapists themselves. And I say, listen, and, and I always tell people this, if you hire somebody for 40 hours a week, you should safely assume that 20% out of their working week is going to be burnt time. That's mm-hmm. meetings, answering the phone, checking their emails. So if you hire somebody at 40 hours and you expect them to bill 40 hours, you're going to be upside down the minute you make the hire. Mm-hmm. So we look at those practitioners. We talk about when you onboard somebody, there's credentialing, there's contracting. It's not like you would just hire a a practitioner and they immediately make you money. There Mm -hmm. are red tape things. So what I say to people is, do you know how from the day you hire somebody till the day that they can fully support their salary, plus make up the money you just paid them for the three months they sat and waited. Do you know what that dollar amount is and how long it's going to take? No way. And I tell people a general rule of thumb is 12 weeks. Any new position should generate, and I'm going to call it refund the business, mm-hmm. in 12 weeks. If you are beyond that 12-week scope, we got a problem. We mm-hmm. use a quick little cheat sheet on Excel that just says, we've got 12 weeks and here's the ramp up. Right. And we try to be as realistic as possible. And I use that every week during that 12-week phase to say, are we actually growing like we should be? Right. Are we actually creating the revenue? And oftentimes, that's where the glitch will happen, right? Yeah. And people will say, but I'm still building their caseload. And that's when I come to the question and say, so how long do you want to spend and lose money, right? Mm -hmm. Before that practitioner can carry their own caseload. Um, And oftentimes if you've saved for that, as long as you're not pinching your cash flow, that's fine. You can take 12 weeks, Mm -hmm. but know that, you know, there are week after week that we anticipate revenue to be coming in and support that position. Right. So we look at what, so we look at utilization is essentially what it is. Mm -hmm. And then also think about, does that actually align with your clinic model, right? Does that align with everything else that you have set forth? Maybe mm-hmm. you have your, your um, technicians or your nurses who are also doing your cleaning. So if they're cleaning, they're not, you know, bringing in patients. Yeah. And we look at the other thing is, is the rate of your patients that come in, like how many new referrals do you get? Once you get them, do you actually close them? You can have a wait list of 600 people, mm-hmm. but if you don't close them and you don't actually start them, mm-hmm. and by start them, I mean you served them and you build and you collected the money. Yeah. People will say, I have a huge wait list. I have a great intake process. Great. You have 600 people, but you're not serving hardly any of them. Or you yeah, don't Where are they? Them. Yeah. When are they starting? Yeah. Looks empty in here. Yeah. And a lot of time is when are they starting is different, right? You might think starting means they called you up. And I might think starting means I actually serve them consistently on their schedule and I'm billing and collecting. Yeah, this is huge. I mean, I, I've talked to more than one where where I could think of a few different current and former clients where in one way or another, they were messing this part up. They either weren't calling back right away. They weren't following up. They you know, the front desk screwed up the call. They screwed up the call. Uh, oh my God. And it's just, I, I don't know. I, it's such a blind spot. I didn't really think about it, but um, until they have signed up, you know, filled out your paperwork, been seen, filed an insurance, like you don't have them. Yeah. You just don't. I would say most business owners will say to me, I'm going to just pass that off to the front desk or the whoever it's going to be. And I always say to them, well, how long are we going to do that? Right. So like, I would say that. How have you trained them to take those? Yeah. Oh my God. I I say this all the time. Have you ever actually just watched them do it? I want you to watch them do it three times. I want you to look for kids because the first time they're going to be nervous, right? Mm -hmm. Second time you're going to have given them feedback. It's going to go a little bit better. And the third time they're going to be good at it where they're not. And you're going to decide that's not the person to do your intakes. You can't bury your head in the sand. Yeah. Yeah. Our recommendation with the core report and looking at those simple, simple numbers is one time a week, 15 minutes. If you cannot digest that information, easily access it from the source, right? From where it is supposed to be pulled from 15 minutes, one time a week. If you cannot get that, we do not have a good pulse on your business. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you pick the right handful of metrics, they tie to the rest of them. So if, you know, you could say your blended rate was down. Okay. Well, we can look at that. That's because of the patient mix. Um, 
caseloads are down. That could be a few things. They're not following up. The close rates down. It's it's you can look at what's behind each one. Once we get them in, they don't stay. They go to a different doctor or therapist because maybe we don't have great uh, ability to keep them engaged as a, a patient or yeah. client. Now, what we do is we start with the very very basics, right? Mm -hmm. and it's just yeah, you got to build your way up to this, yeah. yeah. But as, as our clients have stayed with us, you know, one in two years, we do things like, what's your cancellation rate, right? Is it patients canceling or are you canceling because you had staff that were not there? That's huge. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you as a, as a busy mom of six and a, a business owner, if I have an, this actually just happened, I had a doctor's appointment and he canceled and I thought, no, I'll never see you again. All I did is picked up the phone and called somebody else and I was out the door yeah. because I have to build my schedule, right? So yeah. that's. That doctor, as lovely as he may be, I'll never go back because I can't. Yeah. I, that week had to get it done and had to move on. Yeah. So I say to people, those things are impactful. You will lose patience if you are not steady at being open, serving your patients, not changing their schedules, right? Being timely when they come in to see you. Yeah. If I came to see you and took me 90 minutes, I'm going to be pretty upset. Mm hmm and so what we say to them is let's start with the core being the most simplest of the money that comes in. We also watch on there. Eventually we add in, how long does it take you to collect? You might have a hundred Medicaid patients, but Medicaid might be a 120 day payer. And yeah. you actually are holding on to that for so long and carrying that, but that's not your best. It's yeah. not your best, no matter the rate. Um, or you're spending hours upon hours following up on, you know, Mm -hmm. bad claims or things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And so we try to watch all of those things. And what we do is once we get the basics, we start adding into, okay, what's the next problem? Then yeah. we'll add that metric in. And I think what I would often say is most of the time, I would say the first 30 days we meet somebody, we call it the discovery phase. We're like, show us all of your dirty laundry, right? Mm -hmm. There's no judgment. We've seen it all. Um, we might have a business owner who you know, never factored in their salary. And so they're taking money off the uh, account every month. And so it actually looks like as a business, they're performing beautifully. Mm -hmm. Cash in the bank is not reflective of that. Yeah. Right? So that core report drives the decision-making. And so when we do that, a lot of times our clients will, you know, do this on a Wednesday or a Thursday. And then I say to them, the second we get off this call, what are you going to do for, to predict next week? So we use those same metrics to predict next week. So if you had a clinician that only saw 30 patients, but they were supposed to see 45, I say, you're going to hang up the call. We're going to call that clinician. And we are going to talk about what can we do today and tomorrow to build their schedule next week. Yeah. It's not always fixable. Sometimes it's a time timing thing, Sure, but we've now planted the seed and we've given visibility to that clinician so that they are aware, Hey, this is a problem, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you actually generated 50% of your salary which means the company lost the other 50% yeah. because we didn't have enough clients to support the volume. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think being transparent with that is so important. And I think business owners like to hold that really close to the vest, right? They don't want the confrontation. They don't want, yeah. Any number of reasons. They don't yeah. want to feel money hungry. And I always say to people, I would rather be transparent and open about how the business is doing than to surprise everybody and terminate them. I mean, if your sibling came to you and asked you for the same amount of money, would you give it to them? You'd, you'd wonder, yeah. well, that's what you're doing. You know, yeah. it's kind of the same. You just gave a nice little freebie loan to. Yeah. And we try to prevent business owners from just hiring without having a plan in the first place. So oftentimes mm -hmm. they'll say, tell me what, what's the plan? How are we growing? What are we doing? Once they get that plan, we really do do a lot of follow-up on, are they meeting what they need to meet? Yeah. And and are they spending their time doing what they need to do? So oftentimes they'll be like, no, but they're doing X, Y, Z. And it's really great for the business. Well, it might be, but how long can they not be generating enough to support yeah. themselves? Yeah. You covered a lot of ground. I, it's funny. My next question is what does good look like when this is all said, but you, you kind of answered it. 15 minutes, once a week, you get sort of practiced on asking the handful of whys behind each number, if it's not where it should be. And you just kind of learn it over it, but you, you got to commit to it, right? Oh yeah. You know, I think the other part of it is oftentimes if business owners aren't technology savvy, or maybe they don't feel competent in QuickBooks, or they don't even know where to pull the data from mm -hmm. because they've maybe outsourced it or somebody else is controlling it. I actually say to them, 
what do you have access to? So if I'm on the screen with you right now, I say, why don't you show me how you find this information? And if the answer is, well, I call so-and-so and they give it to me, I say, nope, nope. In my business, I can touch and feel everything that needs to be controlled. Mm -hmm. I want you to have that same power. Well, I don't know how to do QuickBooks. That's all right. Let's teach you. Yeah, right? You don't know yet. You can so learn it. Yeah. You can always learn it. Yeah. And honestly, I always say to people, it is, it is simpler than you would believe, right? Mm -hmm. And if it's not, then we need to figure out if it's the right business model for you. Yeah. Love it. A um, couple of questions I ask every guest kind of in, in closing, because we covered, like I said, just a lot of ground. Is there anything you think I should have asked you or we should have talked about that we didn't? Yeah. I think the one piece of information that we often struggle to get business owners to answer is what do you want your profit margin to be? Right. Do they because, grasp that? That's another one. Do they, do you have six heads as, as you're asking that question? <laughs> we talk about it from the standpoint of your profitability is going to help you pay your taxes. Your profitability is going to give you, I'm going to call it, it's going to pad your savings account. Mm -hmm. Um, if that profitability is also paying your salary, we need to know that so that it's noted somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I always tell people, well, 15% and true profit margin that, that does not take into account, meaning 15% of the revenue that you made is left in the bank for your savings account is what I would call it. After every know. expense, but taxes, right? Before taxes. Yeah, yeah. taxes. And we'll show them. We'll say, you know, it actually probably should have been 30% because we then had taxes that came out or maybe it's actually 40% so we can have your tax savings account. Mm -hmm. And if I can get a business owner who's strong enough cash flow to start putting money in a tax account, that is the best day of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, then I, I like to ask them, right. The second question is what is that profit margin and what would be too much? Right. So mm. I always say 15% after everything is paid taxes, your, the money that's going in your personal pocket. And we've got 15% money that you've invested back into your business. So your building looks good. You yeah. Know, that's, it's yeah. Like, well, that's maintenance. I don't do it every day. No, but any of us know that we're going to have to update our, our materials, our, our instruments, things like that. New phones. Yeah. And did we plan for that? Yeah. Um, if it's at 15% after everything is said and done, I feel so good about your business. If you were at 30 to 40% after everything is said and done, I'm going to start questioning things like, are you skimping on infrastructure? Are you, you know, working mm. too hard? Do you have an unsustainable rate with a funder that looks great this year, but may not work next year mm -hmm. because whoever is dictating that rate may change. Mm -hmm. I always tell people, my job is to help you limit your liabilities and insulate your business from things we know are going to happen. They right. haven't made them today, but they're gonna, right. um, you know, you have a funder that gets held up, things like that. And so yeah. that is the number one question I ask them when we build their business model. Okay. If somebody says 50%. I'm going to say, well, I can't build that for you. Yeah. We're selling. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And then the other question I ask is, all right, we've caught somebody's attention. Who's listening. They want to get started. They, they, they've said to themselves, I'm not where I need to be on this. Sometimes people get stuck at the starting line. So what are one or two simple things they could do to kind of nudge themselves into motion to go down the path of ideally 15 minutes a week. And I, I feel really good about what I see. Yeah. The very first thing I tell people, is, if, if they, didn't have consultants and they didn't know where to start, I would say, I want you to go inside and I want you to find every invoice for the last three months, every expense that you have paid in the last 90 days. And I want you to map it out and you could print out a word calendar for all I care mm -hmm. and write the amounts and what it is in 90 days past. And then I want you to take the next 90 days and do three more word calendars if you have to, right? Mm -hmm. and take those and transfer them to what you know they're going to be in the next three months, mm -hmm. right? Was there anything in there that you could get rid of to decrease your expenses, right? And spend a day getting rid of those, right? Yeah. And then the next thing I want you to do is put in your expected payroll, taxes, everything included for the next three months as well. Well, mm -hmm. now we have expenses that are pretty much going to stay the same unless you're a business that runs on a one-to-one -one ratio, which means if I pay you, you know, if it takes me one more therapist to mm -hmm. serve 10 more clients, I have to factor that in. Sure. And the timing of it. So, so we first just start with expenses. And then the second thing I do is say, 
how much revenue per day. And I want you to literally write it out. So if it's $1,100 a day or $3,000 a day, I want you to show me how you're going to get that. Mm -hmm. Who was working on that day? How many hours? How many patients did they see? What code were you billing for that patient? And yeah. I want you to be perfect, right? I don't want you to just guess. I actually want to do the same thing your previous 90 days. Let's look at that. Mm -hmm. day day, who did you see? What did you bill? Who actually worked? What were their hours? Yeah. And one exercise will give you so much visibility into the roadmap of what you need to do moving forward. It will tell you how much revenue you need to make every day. It'll mm -hmm. tell you what bad days are. And honestly, within six months, three previous months, right? You'll be able to see the behavior pattern of your clients, your patients, your staff, yeah. Yeah. weather, you know, whatever yeah. it is. And that will help you better plan moving forward. So even if you're terrible at Excel, if you can do this, right? I always say, if you got a pencil and you yeah. can print off a stuff <clears throat> word, we can fix this for you. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. This has been, no like I said, it's, 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 like I said at the beginning, we've had service providers come on and talk about numbers, but having someone who's who's you know lived it and is living it yourself, it's a, just it's it's a different perspective, uh, and it says it's possible, right? I mean, when an accountant says, "Look at your numbers," you're like, yeah, okay, of course. But when people who are living it themselves every day, it makes a big difference. Thank you again uh, for coming on Practice Care. Yeah, uh, Allison Holshoff with Obo Consulting. We'll put all the contact info that you gave me into the show notes for your episode, and then a couple of points before we wrap up. First, if you're like Allison or me that we seek to serve private practice owners, or if you're a private practice owner yourself, Allison, you check both boxes. And in either case, if you have had an experience in the business side of private practice that you think others would benefit from hearing, we want you to come on Practice Care and tell the world about it. In the show notes for Allison's episode and every episode, there's a link, couple of clicks, a couple of questions rather, tell us what's on your mind so that we can get you scheduled as soon as possible. And finally, subscribe to Practice Care if you haven't done it already. We're on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google Podcasts, now on YouTube also. Hard not to find us. Please do it because we do, we, we release a new episode every week and that's the best and easiest way to stay current. Thanks very much and until next time.